Good day. Um, open your Bible to uh, Psalm 52. Uh, today we'll be taking up Psalm 52. It's uh, a little bit surprising for me. You know, I read through this uh, just a few minutes ago. I like to refresh myself, of course, a little before we do these video clips. And um, I don't go into a deep study uh, of each, really, because I more or less draw on from previous times that I have meditated on these Psalms to save time. But I just refreshed myself in it. And it dawned on me that... Uh, I don't ever recall having re read this psalm before, but I know I've read the psalm before because I've read the psalms multiple times. I've been saved for 43 years. I've read through the psalms many, many, many times, the psalm included, but I just can't recall having read it. I can't recall what it was about. There's nothing in it that stood out to me. And so in reading it, uh, it's quite an interesting little psalm. And now it does stand out to me, and hopefully I won't forget it this time. So Psalm 52 and basically, um, it's presenting to us the um, uh, characteristic of the Antichrist and his end, his destruction, and him, him being in contrast to the godly remnant, uh, to the godly ones in the last days. Uh, so let's just uh, begin uh, by reading. I'll start um, uh, in verse 1, of course. It's not that long. It's only nine verses. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying uh, more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch, you, uh, snatch and tear you from your tent or from your dwelling place. He will uproot you from the land of the living. So this first part of the psalm gives us the characteristic of the Antichrist and his final destruction. But look at the emphasis here on the tongue. The tongue is brought before us again and again in this first section of the psalm. Uh, verse 2, we get, Thy tongue devises mischief. It's like a sharp razor. It works deceitfully. Uh, he says, in the, in the, uh, the psalmist says in the end of verse 3, the second clause, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Uh, you love all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. You know, it's striking. When we think of uh, the Antichrist, we may think of uh, all sorts of things. We think of his power. We think of uh, him ruling over the nations, the authority he has over the nations. We think of his persecution of the Jews, uh, and on and on it goes. Uh, his ability to marshal the armies of the world and so on. But what the psalm brings before us is the power of his tongue. Now, we get this uh, several times in the Bible. If you turn to uh, the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 7, uh, this feature of his tongue is brought out here as well. It says of the Antichrist, it, he's called here the little horn. In verse 25 of Daniel 7, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change uh, times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and, a, and times and a dividing of time. That's the three and a half years. That's the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, and he'll persecute the, the saints that are on the earth and overpower many of them. But the point we want to bring out here is that the first part of verse 25, Daniel 7, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. He blasphemes the Most High. And we get the same thing in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And speaking of the beast, and this is the western beast uh, that rises up out of the sea of the, of the revived Roman Empire. Uh, the, the beast and the false prophet, you know, they're, they're in cahoots together. And they form that anti-Christian system, the Antichrist, at the end. So verse 5, it says in Revelation 13, verse 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. That's the three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle or his tent and, and them that dwell in heaven. Notice he blasphemes God, but also them that dwell in heaven. That is the church who already been previously uh, raptured up. But he makes war with the saints, you know, the tribulation saints that are on the earth. 
But the, again, the emphasis was, and there was given unto him a great mouth. Um, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. You know, we're reminded too of uh, Paul's epistle, second epistle to Thessalonians, where it says that the people who rejected the gospel and so on, they will believe a, a lie and God will send them strong delusion. And this is through the, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who will work uh, lying wonders amongst them to deceive them. But the strong delusion and the lie, I connect that also with what we've had, the speaking of great things and the blasphemy and so on, that, that it's essentially the power of his tongue that he's able to do what he does. Uh, the, uh, a satanic power will, will be given to him. And, you know, dear friends, like we have uh, history uh, given to us, uh, events in our past history that were forerunners of these things given as a warning to us. And we think of um, Adolf Hitler. You know, I read um, William Shire's classic Rise and Fall of the Third Reich uh, several years ago. And he speaks of Hitler after he had come back uh, from the First World War. He was just a corporal in the First World War. He was nothing outstanding. He had, he failed in school. He wasn't good in school. He was sort of a drifter and then he was a corporal in the First World War. And he was just basically a vagabond wandering the streets of, of Vienna, Austria, and then back in his home in Germany. And he wandered into a beer hall one night where a little uh, party was um, having a um, uh, some type of get together, you know, a speech. They were giving speeches. It was the uh, uh, the embryo of what would become the Nazi party. It was some type of workers' party, a revolutionary party. It was only about fifty or sixty people in the hall, and he wandered in and he took his place at the head of the hall and began speaking to them. And then um, this recorded that Hitler realized for the first time that he had the power of speech given to him, and that he was he mesmerized that audience. He had them hanging on his every word. He realized that a certain power, well, we know where that power comes from. It was the satanic power. And of course, it was through basically his speeches that he rose to his great position of power in Germany. So there's a little forerunner of that very thing that will come in a future day with the Antichrist. Now, in the rest of the psalm, we get contrasted with him, the godly. So in verse 6, it says, The righteous also shall uh, see and fear and shall laugh at him. You know, in Psalm 2, we get God uh, laughing at the ungodly, but now we have in <clears throat> verse 6 of uh, Psalm 52, the righteous <clears throat> shall laugh at the ungodly. Verse 7, lo, this man, this is the man that made not God his strength. Now, speaking of Antichrist again, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. He trusted in his own strength. He trusted in his own wickedness, but he made not God his strength. He rejected God. And then he's contrasted again with the, the righteous, with the godly. Of the righteous, he says, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. And so <clears throat> we get this in the Psalms again and again, where we get the righteous and the ungodly, or the godly and the ungodly contrasted. And so we see the righteous here described as, a, he describes himself as a green olive tree. The olive tree in the Bible speaks of fruitfulness. It's one of the symbols of, of the people of Israel, the olive tree. You get the fig tree, the olive tree, and the vine. They're all different aspects of Israel, speak of different um, uh, aspects of, of the people of Israel. But the olive tree speaks generally of fruitfulness. And this is so much like what we've had in Psalm 1 where we see that the righteous are like the tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf does not wither, and whatsoever he does is, uh, shall prosper. But again, contrasted with the ungodly. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So it's very much like what we have here in Psalm uh, 52. And then we get the concluding verse of the psalm. It says, I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the, of the godly. And so this righteous remnant will be waiting for the Lord, and they will laugh at the destruction of the wicked one, of the Antichrist. And so, so much for us, two uh, brothers and sisters, that it's so much um, an encouragement to us to be on the line of the godly. 
Let us seek godliness and holiness in our ways and not be drawn into the wickedness of the world, to be separate from it uh, by the grace and power of the Lord, to magnify and glorify his name, to make him our strength, to make him our trust, and we'll be like that uh, olive tree and we'll bear fruit for him in this world that has rejected him. May the Lord bless your day today as we continue on and as we wait for the coming of our Lord.